Your oh, Excellency, Dr. Kissinger, dear guests, today we are gathered here to commemorate the 50th anniversary of Dr. Kissinger's secret trip to China. 50 years ago, Dr. Kissinger made a secret trip to China by Pakistan, which paved the way for President Nixon's subsequent visit to China and the issuance of the Shanghai communique by the two countries. This ice-breaking trip shocked the world. It demonstrated the extraordinary political wisdom and outstanding diplomatic skills of the older generation of Chinese and American leaders. It also opened a new chapter in China-US relations and the global politics. It profoundly changed the course of history. Fifty years on, China and the United States, two major countries with vast differences in political systems, development stages, histories, and cultures, have witnessed continued progress in bilateral relations despite ups and downs. Our relations have brought tremendous benefits for both our two peoples and greatly boosted world peace, prosperity, and stability. Since the establishment of diplomatic ties, China-US trade has increased by more than 250 times. At the beginning of our relations, two-way investment was next to zero. At of the end of last year, U.S. direct investment in China exceeded 90 billion U.S. dollars in cumulative terms, and the total Chinese direct investment in the United States surpassed 83 billion U.S. dollars. Mutual visits between our two peoples had grown from only a few thousand to over 5 million a year before the pandemic. More than 400,000 Chinese students are now studying in the United States. 50 pairs of sister provinces states and 232 pairs of sister cities have been established. Our two countries have engaged in practical exchanges in areas such as military, law enforcement, culture, and a subnational cooperation, and maintain the close coordination on regional hotspots, including the Iranian nuclear issue, Afghanistan, and the Middle East. We have also carried out effective cooperation in counterterrorism, non-proliferation, counter-narcotics, poverty alleviation, peacekeeping, and other areas. Our two countries have cooperated in tackling the 1997 Asian financial crisis and the 2008 global financial crisis. And it jointly facilitated the adoption of the Paris Agreement on Climate Change making important contributions to global economic stability and recovery and international cooperation on climate change. I wish to take this opportunity to pay high respect to Dr. Kissinger and all those who had contributed to the normalization of China-US relations. I also wish to express sincere thanks to people from all sectors of our two countries who have cared for and supported China-US relations over the decades. Dear guests, China-U.S. relations now stand at a critical juncture. 
the future of this relationship is a matter of interest, not only to our two peoples, but also to the wider international community. In his phone call with President Joe Biden on the eve of the Chinese New Year, President Xi Jinping underscored the importance for China and the United States to follow the spirit of no conflict, no confrontation, mutual respect and win-win cooperation. Resume regular dialogue and exchanges, carry out a mutually beneficial cooperation, properly manage differences, and avoid misperception and a miscalculation in order to promote the sound and a steady growth of bilateral relations. Here in China, we have just celebrated the centenary of the Communist Party of China, or CPC. The very aim of the CPC's 100-year struggle is to pursue happiness for the people and rejuvenation for the nation. China's development is an opportunity for the world. China and the United States should be partners for common development. We need to uphold principles, show mutual respect, and seek common ground while reserving differences. The three China-US joint communiques provide the fundamental guide for all two countries to correctly manage bilateral relations. We need to act in the spirit of the three communiques, respect each other's sovereignty, security, and development interests. Properly address differences and frictions through dialogue and consultation and accommodate each other's concerns in a balanced way. This is key to the steady development of China-US relations. We need to follow the new circumstances and changes and continue to expand our common interests. In an ever-growing world, the areas where China and the United States can work together have not narrowed, but expanded. From COVID-19 to economic recovery, from fentanyl to cybersecurity, from climate change, to nuclear non-proliferation, and from artificial intelligence to space exploration. Closer China-US coordination and cooperation is not only in the interest of the two countries, but also conducive to peace and the progress of the whole world. We need to keep enhancing people-to-people -people exchanges and a cement the popular support for bilateral relations in both countries. Amity between the people holds the key to sound state-to-state -state relations. The attempts to obstruct normal exchanges between the two countries by abusing the concept of national security and manipulating ideological differences run counter to the trend of history. We need to encourage the people and the various sectors of both countries to conduct more exchanges and interactions and make greater efforts to learn about each other's historical and cultural features, thinking patterns, customs, and the choices of development path and system in order to build a strong foundation for bilateral relations. In setting its China strategy, the United States should avoid creating a vicious cycle of misleading and miscalculation. The United States is now making China an imaginary enemy in the name of competition and deliberately creating an atmosphere of suspicion, confrontation, and a win-or-lose rivalry. This would probably result in a scenario 
in which strategic misleading triggers strategic miscalculation, and strategic miscalculation leads to more strategic misleading. The U.S. side needs to know that its biggest challenge does not come from the outside, and still less from China. But surely, from the inside, dear guests, we live in a colorful world, and every civilization has its own distinctive features. The Chinese civilization and American culture are different in significant ways, but we can also find commonalities in terms of philosophy, life sciences, and human nature. It is therefore possible for us to achieve common development based on mutual understanding, inclusiveness, and through mutual learning. I am convinced that with a commitment to the vision of a shared future for all mankind, There will be no fundamental conflicts or irreconcilable interests between China and the United States, and the two countries will be able to find a path of peaceful coexistence and a win-win cooperation. With that, I wish this event a full success. Thank you. Well, that is my prepared speech. It's a rare opportunity for us to meet Dr. Kissinger, although not in person. So I want to say a few words off the script. The first time I met Dr. Kissinger was in 1990. That was a trip I made to New York. We had a brief conversation on that occasion. At the end of the conversation, Dr. Kissinger did not give any response to the points I made, but he said a lot of good words uh, on praises about my former interpreter. He said, my interpreter did a awesome job and that left me a deep impression because for the purpose of meeting dr kissinger i found a good interpreter that is miss uh, 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 miss tang jian shen the, uh, the sister of uh, madame tang wen shen who is also present today So Dr. Kinsinger knew that uh, the interpreter was the sister, younger sister of uh, Madame Tang Wenshen's. That's why he um, um, offered a lot of praises um, to my interpreter. How time flies! Thirty-one years have passed have passed since my first meeting with Dr. Kinsinger. So I just want to repeat the point I made to Dr. Kinsinger in 2019. For you, a person with both longevity uh, and uh, good fortune, what's most important for you is to stay healthy. And longevity is most important for you. I wish you stay healthy, Dr. Kissinger. Thank you, Vice President Wang Qishan. Now I want to give the floor to the Honorary Chair of the National Committee, Ambassador Carla Hills. She will invite Dr. Kissinger to give a speech. Thank you very much. It is a great pleasure to participate in this 50th anniversary, celebrating the meeting that constituted a first step in the renewal of our bilateral relations. And it's a great honor to introduce the man who orchestrated the process. Henry Kissinger, a dear friend and Secretary of State to two presidents, President Nixon and President Ford has had a profound positive impact 
on U.S. foreign policy for over six decades. He pioneered the policy of the front, negotiated a ceasefire and the Paris Peace Accords that brought an end to the Vietnam War. He is a recipient of a very long list of prestigious awards, including the Presidential Medal of Freedom, our nation's highest Italian award, the Medal of, of Liberty, and the Nobel Peace Prize. Tonight, as we celebrate his secret visit to Beijing on July 9, 1971, and the groundwork for President Nixon's visit to China, a meeting with Chairman Mao and Premier Zhou Enlai, and resulted in the signing of the Shanghai Communique, restoring diplomatic relations between China and the United States, clearly a great diplomatic achievement in our history. He has authored dozens of books, each of which has achieved high acclaim, including his outstanding volume entitled On China. His prolific writing and meetings with global leaders continue to influence thinking of critical foreign policy issues today. The richness and breadth of his many contributions to a broader understanding of key foreign policy issues brings to mind the words of E.H. Chopin, not armies or nations have advanced the race, but here and there, in the course of ages, an individual has stood up and cast a shadow over the world. Henry, we thank you for all you have done. Very much look forward to your remarks. Carla, Mr. Vice President, it is very meaningful to me to address this meeting in Villa 25, which was my first experience in China, and which I recall with so much affection and pride in the evolution that had followed afterwards. Mr. Vice President, thank you for taking the time to attend this meeting. I have taken the liberty of recording my speech earlier today, but I'm honored to be able to attend this meeting. I will listen to myself and the rest of, of this. So my gratitude to you, Mr. Vice President, from whom I have learned so much in our many conversations and to let me express again how much the relationship to China with China means to me but above all how important it is for our two people and as you pointed out Mr. Vice President for the rest of the world and so with your permission, I will turn you now over to the video I made only two hours ago. Mr. Vice President, distinguished guests, and all the friends in this room, including those who shared the occasion 50 years ago. When we arrived in China, after months of exchanges through secret channels, it was one of the most important occasions of our lives. President Nixon had proposed that the contact be established between our two countries after 20, 25 years of confrontation and absence of official dialogue. So we did not know what 
we would find when we came to China. We were greeted by Master Ye Chen Yin and taken to a state guest house where a few hours later, our conversations with Premier Zhou Enlai started. The essence of these discussions was that both sides were committed to end the tensions that had characterized our relationship for 25 years, including a period of actual warfare. And President Nixon proposed this opening because he thought the American people needed a vision of peace rather than the conflicts in Indochina that were raging at the time. And because Chairman Mao and Premier Zhou Enlai on the Chinese thought that the security of China would be enhanced by becoming part of the international diplomatic system and of a relationship with the United States. Our meetings were conducted in that spirit. We explained to each other our understanding of the various issues before us. We did not seek to come to an agreement on that first visit, but to create the basis for subsequent negotiations. In the months afterwards, on the basis of another trip by me to China, and then the president's visit in February 1972, a series of understandings were reached between the United States and China. The most important words that the United States acknowledged that the Chinese people consider Taiwan a part of China and that there was only one China and that we would not challenge that proposition. At the same time, Chairman Mao made it clear that the Taiwan problem might require a long period for a final resolution. And so the two sides for the decades afterwards have moved on the basis of mutual restraint. And they attempted to settle issues between them on a wide variety of topics in that spirit. In that period, China has made spectacular progress economically and has become one of the great industrial, economic and political powers in the world. So here we are 50 years later in a situation in which the need for cooperation has not diminished, but the mechanisms and the procedures and maybe the understandings have not yet been fully worked out, but it remains important for the world and important for our two countries to understand that the premise which led to the visit 
in 1971 is still valid. In fact, even more valid than it was then. In the meantime, the technology on which the economic progress of China and the United States have been based has become infinitely more complicated. And we're in fact in a new period of technology which will affect the attitude of men and women towards reality in a fundamental way. So that the importance of the relationship between our two countries remains crucial and as in fact is more important even than in 1971. Conflict between the United States and China it will divide the whole world and attempts to line up nations on one side or the other will create divisions in the world and temptations and pressures that will become increasingly difficult to solve. So we need a dialogue very similar to the one that President Nixon conducted with Premier Zhou and Chairman Mao on his 1972 visit, and which I had the honor to initiate on the visit that we are celebrating here in 19. 71, and which lasted for most of the, of the 50 years since then. It was based on the fact that each side made a serious effort to understand not only the immediate positions of the other, but the evolution that brought both sides to the difficulties and challenges that had arisen. This is not always simple, given the cultural differences in the evolutions of our history. We in America tend to look for pragmatic solutions to the immediate problems. China, based on its own history, looks at the international situation from, a, from the point of view of historical evolution. So to match the longer and shorter perspectives of the immediate problems is not easy. But it is the fundamental challenge of our time. And I therefore hope that a serious dialogue starts soon again on the major issues between us. Each nation should designate an individual with the confidence of their president to guide this discussion. And we will keep in mind on both sides that not every problem can have an immediate solution. And we should start from the promise, premise that war 
between our two countries would be an unspeakable catastrophe that cannot be won and that we owe it to each other's people and to the world to settle our differences by dialogue and mutual understanding. I have had the honor of several conversations with the Vice President who has preceded me in, these, in this event. And I want to thank him for the courtesy, understanding and insight with which he contributed to my understanding of Chinese history and Chinese challenges. And I would like to think that I made a perhaps more limited contribution from my side to, to this dialogue. So at this moment, peace, stability, and progress in the world depends on the wisdom of both sides in explaining the challenges and perhaps in discovering common opportunities. This was the spirit with which Vincent Lord, who was then my closest associate and who will speak this evening, will arrive in China. And this was the spirit in which Zhou and Lai saw to it that what seemed to us at first the mysteries of China became somewhat more transparent. And so I hope at 50 years from now, people may meet and mark this day as a starting point for fulfilling what we began as emissaries of our government and what the Chinese leaders contributed on their side for which I want to thank them for the courtesy and elegance and understanding with which we were received 50 years ago when we arrived in a country that was not yet well known to us and which we began to understand and appreciate more and more as the decades went on. And that spirit, I hope, will be preserved and strengthened in the decades ahead. So I hope that all my Chinese friends and all the Americans who are participating in this discussion keep this objective in mind that we need peace for our countries, ability for the world, and China and the United States can make a decisive contribution to this. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Dr. Kissinger. Once again, a big thank you to Vice President Wang Qishan and Dr. Kissinger. This will be the end of the first part of our commemorative event. With a warm round of applause, we will thank Vice President Wang Qishan and Dr. Kissinger. Now, may I give the floor to anchor Wang Guan from CGTN. He will moderate the second part of the event. Distinguished guests, 
Ladies and gentlemen, friends, good morning. As a student of China-U.S. relations, I've been deeply involved in reporting and covering the events of China-U.S. relations. I'm extremely delighted and excited today. I had the opportunity to see that Dr. Kissinger is still very energetic today. Madam Tang and Mr. Lian are also with us today. Um, when I asked her whether I should call her Madam Tang, she replied that you can simply call me Old Tang, Lao Tang, as uh, in order to show that she's very kind to us. We will have two separate events to discuss the significance of the secret trip 50 years ago. In the first session, we are very honored to have invited two witnesses, four witnesses of China-U.S. relations. I will introduce a mentor of mine, a friend of mine, an important guest today. 50 years ago, she worked as a diplomat, a young diplomat in Hong Kong. She was told to receive a ping pong delegation from the U.S. She didn't imagine that she would be staying here for 50 years. She witnessed the ping pong diplomacy and a wide range of people to people exchanges. She also came from the National Committee. Now a warm welcome to Vice Chair Jen Barris from the National Committee of U.S.-China Relations. Bai Li Juan Nushi, Jen Barris. Jen, it's great to see you. Um, I hope you have been doing well, and I heard Thank that you. you got an exciting panel today. Take it over. Okay. Thank you so much, Guan. I really appreciate that warm introduction. Uh, I'm delighted you mentioned the fact that I got a call asking me to go to the National Committee to help with preparations for the ping pong team. At the time, I was in Hong Kong as a foreign service officer, uh, and I wasn't quite sure I wanted to do it for a whole variety of reasons. However, when I was trying to make up my mind, it was the summer, early summer of 1971. Uh, the National Committee had offered me a job. I was thinking about it, wasn't quite sure. And then suddenly, President Nixon gets on television on July 15, 1971, and announces that Dr. Kissinger has secretly been to China and that he too would soon be going to China in February 1972. Suddenly, my decision became a no-brainer. I called the National Committee the next day and said, when do you want me? I'll be there. So a, an event like we're commemorating today that had extraordinary repercussions for the world also was an event that had enormous consequences for me. Because as uh, Juan just mentioned, I thought I was taking a year's leave of absence from the Foreign Service. And 50 years later, I'm still around. So one of the best things in, that past, in the past 50 years, for me at least, in working at the National Committee, has been that I've had the opportunity to meet and to get to know so many interesting and wonderful people. And I'm really happy that four of those people, uh, actually five of those people, since um, my co-moderator, Wang Guang, I, we, as a, a recent participant in the National Committee program, but even though I only met him three years ago, I've known the other four people on this panel for almost 50 years, and in one case, 52 years. So it's both an honor and a real pleasure for me to briefly introduce my old friends, Wada Lao Peng Yo. So let me start first with Tang Wen Shang. She's known to her many former friends, uh, many, many friends, former and <laughs> current friends, as Nancy. Nancy was born in New York City. 
but left at the age of nine to go back to China with her family. But her early exposure to English served her very well throughout her career. First in the foreign ministry, where she worked in the translation department and the Department for American and Oceanian Affairs. And then later when she held leadership positions at a variety of really interesting organizations, the China Daily, the Ministry of Railways, the Songxing Ling Foundation, the All China Federation of Returned Overseas Chinese, the Translators, Translators Association of China, and last but certainly not least, she was a council member of today's host organization, the Chinese People's Institute of Foreign Affairs. As has been mentioned, while at the Foreign Ministry, she interpreted for Chairman Mao, Premier Zhou, Deng Xiaoping, and so many other Chinese leaders. And as you will hear in our discussion, she was also very involved in the visit of 50 years ago. But I really loved hearing this new fact that I didn't know about you, Nancy, and that is that your sister is also a, a very qualified and good interpreter, that, as we learned from Vice President Wang. So your parents must be really proud of the two of you. Now I want to turn to another old friend who was always present at the meetings that I was fortunate enough to attend with China's senior leaders, and that's Ambassador Lian Zhengbao. He joined the Foreign Ministry of Affairs in 1965, holding several important positions in the ministry, including Deputy Council General in both Houston and the New York consulates. Uh, he was ambassador to N Namibia, and his last job was as chief archivist of the Foreign Ministry's Bureau of Archives. A very fitting position for a person like himself who contributed so much to that archive. As Ambassador Lian took notes in shorthand for nearly 300 meetings between foreign guests and Chinese leaders, including Chairman Mao and Zhou Enlai and Deng Xiaoping and Jiang Zemin. And among those 300 meetings, were the 17 hours of discussions during the event that we're commemorating today. And as well as President taking all of the notes in the senior leader meetings when President Nixon visited China in 1972. As for the American panelists, Winston Lord, our former ambassador to China and an assistant secretary of state for East Asian Pacific Affairs has been at the center of US-China relations for over four decades. Throughout the 1970s, he accompanied Presidents Nixon and Ford, as well as Dr. Kissinger, on their nine trips to China, beginning with the trip we're celebrating today. And he was in every one of their meetings with Chairman Mao, Premier Zhou, and Deng Xiaoping. While he began his career at the Department of State, he also worked at the Defense Department and the National Security Council. And as is common in the United States, he moved in and out of the government, holding prominent jobs in the foreign sector as well, including president of the Council on Foreign Relations, chairman of the National Endowment for Democracy, and currently he's the chairman emeritus of the International Rescue Committee. And if we have time today, maybe he'll tell you his famous story of how actually he was the first one, not Dr. Kissinger, into China in 1971. And finally, like Ambassador Lord, Ambassador Char Chaz W. Freeman began his professional career in the State Department. And also like Ambassador Lord, he too served in the Defense Department. The other thing these two men have in common is that their innate talent was recognized very early and they rose quickly through the ranks. In Chaz's case, he served as Director for Chinese Affairs as deputy director, I'm sorry, as deputy chief of mission and charge at our embassies in Beijing and in Bangkok, as the principal deputy assistant secretary of state for African affairs, and as our US ambassador to Saudi Arabia. Even though he was not on the secret trip, he was still studying Chinese at the time, he was the principal American interpreter for President Nixon's visit to China in 1972 which actually is quite a feat. I am a personal witness to the fact that Chaz did not start studying Chinese until January of 1969. And three years later, there he is in China as the principal interpreter for the president. So we only have a half hour for this panel, uh, not nearly enough time to explore 
the many interesting stories that we could delve into. So let's get right to it. I want to start at the beginning, uh, and that's going to be a question for Wynne Lord, because he was there right at the beginning. So when the story of the subterfuge, uh, Dr. Kissinger's purported stomachache, ostensibly going off to a mountain town in Pakistan to recuperate, but instead flying to Beijing under a shroud of secrecy. That is all well known. But what I think a lot of people don't know or understand is uh, what made the trip possible. Prior to 1971, China and the United States had gone without contact for 22 years. So how did the planning for this trip begin? Did the process go smoothly? And what, and what signals and, and how were they sent between the two countries so that we even knew that there would be an openness to this rapprochement? Thank okay. you, Jan. <laughs> I am delighted and I am nostalgic to join everyone at this event in the very villa and perhaps the very room where I had the privilege of sitting next to Dr. Kissinger and across the table from Premier Zhou Enlai during this momentous secret trip 50 years ago. I'm pleased to be joined in this event by Dr. Kissinger, my mentor, and sometimes my tour mentor, to whom I will always be deeply grateful for me personally and for what he's done for our country. Also to be joined by my two co-panelists on the Chinese side, as well as my friend, Ambassador Freeman, Ambassador Lian, and young Madam Tang. Uh, we were all privileged to take part in historic events, not only this particular trip, but subsequent trips and meetings throughout the decade. And in the case of Nancy, if I may call her that, she was the very first Chinese communist I ever met. Because as we boarded the plane, the Pakistani plane in Islamabad, there she was sitting with three other high level Chinese officials that Prime Minister Zhou Enlai had sent to Islamabad to express his warm welcome and accompany us on the flight to Beijing. Now to get to your question, one week after President Nixon was inaugurated, he sent a memo to Dr. Kissinger saying he wanted to get in touch with the Chinese and try to forge a new relationship. That's how high a priority this was. And we found out the Chinese would be receptive so that both sides had two tracks and two challenges to undertake. How we could publicly signal various audiences that we were going to move toward each other and privately, how we could get in touch when we had no diplomatic relations or communications. On the American side, we took publicly some unilateral economic steps, releasing some restrictions on trade with the Chinese. Uh, we also used the proper nomenclature for the Chinese government. And we sent signals through various speeches and foreign policy reports. All of this designed to tell the American people and the world and the Chinese that we were ready to move ahead. The Chinese on their side sent signals. There was an interview that Chairman Mao gave to the journalist Edgar Snow indicating they'd welcome an American visitor, but ironically, we never saw or were aware of this interview until after we took the first trips. But the most famous one in which Jan Barris was uh, a part of, was the National Committee hosting uh, after the dramatic invitation uh, by Chairman Mao to the American ping pong team in Japan. And Joe and I gave them a very warm welcome indeed. Now this did three things that was typical of Chinese soldiers. First, it told the Chinese people and the Chinese allies in the world that they were willing to move ahead. Secondly, it was a public response to our private messages seeking to arrange the visit, reassuring us. And thirdly, it was demonstrating to the American public and the world that they were willing to be flexible and it was incumbent for us to do the same. 
Let me conclude with the second challenge, which was the private communications. We tried to get in touch with the Chinese through various channels, including France and Romania, the Chinese that we settled on a mutual friend, uh, Pakistan. Uh, Joe and I would write handwritten messages to President Nixon and Dr. Kissinger. They would be delivered in Washington by the Pakistani ambassador. And Dr. Kissinger and I would uh, make responses uh, through the same channel. Over the course of a couple of years, these messages set up the rationale for a secret trip and searching for ways to move on to a presidential trip. Thank you. Thank you, Wynn, for that background. And Nancy, I, if, again, I'm, we're old friends, so I feel comfortable calling you Nancy. Um, you and three others were sent to Pakistan uh, to accompany Dr. Kissinger and his three colleagues. So what was the atmosphere like on your plane as you flew from Beijing to Pakistan in terms of the, what were you, were you fearful of what was going to come? Were you excited? And then what was it like on the trip from Pakistan back to Beijing? And what were your first impressions of the Americans, the four Americans you were traveling with at that point? <laughs> Thanks, Jan, but I think I have to speak Chinese because we have so many Chinese guests here, if, if you will pardon me. Uh, is that okay with you? I hope. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, well, it was a very secretive trip to Pakistan, and nobody knew that we boarded the plane. The plane landed in a very far corner of an airport in Islamabad. And uh, we went right away to the embassy after uh, after leaving the plane. And uh, we didn't meet anyone because we didn't want anyone to know what we were doing over there. And uh, at that night, the president, uh, President Khan treated us a dinner and uh, briefed us on a potential trip. The other day, at 3.30 early in the morning, we left the hotel and uh, arrived at the airport 10 minutes before departure. Uh, 10 minutes before arrival, and uh, five minutes earlier before the departure we saw the american delegation boarding the plane and uh, after five minutes the plane took off so it was the first time that we met i mean the chinese and the american delegations uh we were pretty polite uh in our discussion with each other and we started with some small talks uh, leading to the upcoming visit. There was no serious topics being discussed on the plane, which were saved for the conversation with the premier. And we flew over the Tibetan plateau. It was a very magnificent view of the plateau. It was the only time in my life that I saw the scenery. And then we landed at Nanyuan Airport in Beijing. It was a military airport by then. And it was uh, uh, General Ye Jianying and the other Chinese officials who greeted the US delegation. There was the uh, Hong Xi uh, sedan, the red flag sedan. And nobody can see through the window of the car. And we arrived at the Diao Yutai State Guest House through Tiananmen Square. And uh, Dr. Kissinger peeped through the window to see the Tiananmen Square, but he didn't even dare to pull up the curtain inside the car. Madam Tang, 
Dr. Kissinger and the U.S. delegation stayed in China for 48 hours for the first visit. It was a very historical event. And uh, how did you feel about receiving such a high-level delegation from uh, a foreign country? Well, by then, I was pretty busy with the interpreting for the event, so I didn't uh, really pay attention to other feelings. Indeed, it was a very unique event, a very historic moment. How come a U.S. high-level official is coming here to Beijing to meet with our premier? They stand, they stand very straight up to show courtesy. And I could see Dr. Kissinger a pretty, a pretty tense standing there. And later he told me that because uh, he was wearing a shirt that was borrowed from other members of the delegation. <laughs> and uh, the leaders shook hands and uh, they entered the venue for the meeting. Actually, it was not four people arriving in Beijing. There were two security details. And uh, they carry very big suitcases, black suitcases. Maybe it was all the classified materials in the suitcases. And the two security people, they never leave their boxes, uh, suitcases unattended. Previously, there was no precedent that foreign security personnel were allowed for meetings with our leaders. And later I figured that uh, those security people, they were watching the Chinese side to see uh, what we tend to do to Dr. Kissinger and other US leaders. And perhaps maybe also for the safety reasons for the materials in the suitcases. Indeed, very intriguing event. Ambassador Lian, as we know, in the visit in 1971, Dr. Kissinger spent over 17 hours with the premier out of the script, mostly. We know that note-taking is pretty difficult, especially for Mandarin. As the note-taker by then, how did you manage to memorize all those details? How did you manage to note it down? And what is your feeling today? Thank you for your question. Back in 1971, during Dr. Kissinger's secret trip to China, and in 1972, during President Nixon's historic visit, I was present as a note taker in both meetings with Premier Zhou Enlai. That was a heavy task. I did shorthand. I could um, take notes of uh, more than 200 characters per minute. So I kept every word in the conversation between Dr. Kissinger, Premier Zhou Enlai. I was also present in Premier Zhou's dinner with uh, Dr. Kissinger. I wrote down every joke shared by Dr. Kissinger at the dining table. And Chairman Mao was very happy to see those jokes because the details matter. From the details, you could tell the attitude of the American side. And I think that experience was very memorable for me. For example, in the meeting, the Chinese-American sites talked about um, many important issues. Dr. Kinsley was in Beijing for 48 hours, and Premier Chou spent 17 hours with him. And most of the time, they were talking about international affairs. I think the reason 
is that the Premier Joe cared a lot about China's security interests. What was important for him was to create a security environment conducive to China. So Premier Joe talked about Indochina, Middle East, Japan, North Korea, and many other important security issues with Dr. Kissinger. And he reminded Dr. Kissinger that uh, the United States should watch out for a revival of militarism in Japan. And Premier Zhou also briefed Dr. Kissinger, or the, uh, Dr. Kissinger briefed Premier Zhou about um, the negotiations on Indochina. And Premier Zhou said that um, the Vietnam War should be put to an end as early as possible to rest, return peace to the Vietnamese people. What I was impressed most about the conversation, about the meeting, is the negotiation that led to the issuance of the joint communique. I think that joint communique is a classic example and a masterpiece of uh, negotiations based on the principle of seeking common ground while resolving, reserving differences. Because in the joint communique, both sides made their position clear, laid out their differences and the common views. I think that was a very effective approach. So the joint communique issued between the two countries left a deep impression on my mind. When Premier Cho saw the draft provided by the US side, he said, well, there was something valuable in the draft, but um, um, it is important for us to follow the approach used by the Kuomintang, the Communist Party of China in Chongqing negotiations. Oh, indeed, this um, process leading to negotiations is a masterpiece in international negotiations. Jan, do you have anything? Do you have anything to add? No, no I, was I was just going, going to, to ask when, and you tell us whether you think each side's goals for the secret mission, the secret meeting, were achieved. Yes, it was a classic win-win situation, which each side listened to the other's real needs as well as their constraints. So the Chinese met in the secret trip and then the Nixon trip and the follow-on opening. There are two primary objectives. One, to balance the security threat they saw coming from the Soviet Union. And secondly, to break out of diplomatic isolation during the Cultural Revolution so that they could lead to uh, negotiations and normalization with other countries once we open the door. And those two objectives were achieved, including China getting into the United Nations. They also got a general statement on one China that has been mentioned on the U.S. side. For the American side, we wanted to talk to one-fifth of the world's people. We wanted to improve relations with Moscow, we wanted help on ending the Vietnam War. We wanted to show the world we could act dramatically on the world stage. And we wanted to lift the morale of the American people that had uh, been mired in riots and assassinations in the Vietnam War. All of these were achieved. I don't have time to go into detail. But we also, both sides agreed to put aside issues that couldn't be resolved immediately and to forge these common areas of interest. So yes, it was a classic case of listening to one another and meeting each other halfway so that we could have, as I said, in the Chinese parlance, a win-win situation. Thank you, Wen. And Faz, we haven't heard from you yet. So let's move from the past and the history of this event and talk a little bit about the current situation. So there's a very strong sentiment, as you know, centered in Washington that engagement has only benefited China, and that since China has not turned into a Western-style democracy, we should therefore disengage or, or decouple. 
So as moderator, I know I'm not supposed to show my own personal feelings, but I vehemently disagree with that mindset uh, and its underlying premise. So I just wonder what your take is on that, the whole disengagement, engagement. Well, I agree. Dr. Kissinger took exactly the right approach. And by contrast to the usual papers that one writes for diplomatic encounters, we started off with a description of what the Chinese position was, why China had that position before we got to And this expressed the fundamental element of the success, that each side listened to the other, respected its opinion, may not have agreed with it, uh, but tried to understand where the other side was coming from. So I think uh, that was my dominant impression as a worker bee paper writer for the trip. Thank you, Chaz. Guan, did you have something? Um, yeah, Chaz, very briefly, if you can, I can ask a follow-up question. Um, you know, many in the West argue that the engagement they think failed because the Western world failed to turn China into a Western style democracy. And that's why disengagement should be the option. Uh, how do you look at that? Objective to open itself up and take a different direction. It did so on its own, not because of the United States. You know, in 1971, 72, we were headed not into uh, a liberal China, but one dominated by the gang of four. Uh, and in the Shanghai communique, both sides acknowledged that our socioeconomic systems and histories were different and said, nonetheless, we have things we can cooperate about. So let's set those differences aside and get on with cooperation. And it worked. It was very good for the United States and for China. So I completely disagree with the uh, assertion that engagement failed. And I hope we will re-engage in the spirit with which Dr. Kissinger opened this relationship. Indeed, that is the hope of many. Now, China-US relations are facing pressure and challenge. Madam Tang, recalling the past days, what do you think can be, or what do you think that can be drawn as, as inspiration? Well, let me say that uh, the core of this issue is that how could we sit at the same table together back then and how could we have uh, gone such a long way over the years? I think it is because of the political insight of our leaders who have recognized the essence of the issue. They have broad visions and they think in long terms. Both sides are clear that uh, they both uh, approached this, uh, uh, they both uh, com commit themselves to engagement because of their own interests. The two countries are different. Back then, I think the leaders did not have this fantasy that uh, uh, one side could change the other. However, uh, our two countries enjoyed uh, converging grounds and there is a lot big, a big difference we can make starting from this convergence, but we do not have this illusion that uh, uh, we need to change the other side because it is ultimately a country's own independent decision of choosing the policies of its own. The policies are not decided by foreign countries. It is because of the insight, the vision, and the decisiveness of our leaders who have enabled the progress of the relations. For example, I recall that uh, Dr. Kissinger sat down at the table with a huge uh, binder while Premier Joe did not even have a talking point. 
And then the U.S. side uh, voiced its statement of the United States did not support uh, two Chinas or one China, one Taiwan. And then after that, Premier Zhou said, well, we can start the conversation now. I think that was exactly testament to the fact that the two sides have common understanding and the Shanghai communique did cover a lot of converging grounds in terms of people to people exchanges and in other areas. And there is a lot uh, we can do in terms of cooperation and we can do many things in parallel. I think that is a very important point. And without that, the normalization of relations couldn't have been possible. And I think this spirit continues to apply today and needs to be preserved. Well, Ambassador Lin, how do you see the current difficulties and tensions in China-US relations? And what do you think we can learn from the past 50 years? Uh, I think my deepest impression about that visit was both China and the United States had the sincerity to improve bilateral relations. Both countries had the hope and the willingness to improve bilateral relations, put an end to the past, and open up a new chapter. And both countries did a lot of work, and it took a lot of concrete actions to make that happen. And that spirit is still relevant today. Why did the two sides, why were the two sides able to seek common ground while resolving differences despite the disagreements over a lot of issues? That is something we need to think about even today. And the conversation and the negotiations at the time were conducted in a friendly and a harmonious atmosphere. Indeed, Dr. Kissinger's secret trip to China and President Nixon's historic visit to China were both a huge success. And that was a product of uh, joint efforts of two countries and also uh, the demonstration of sincerity of both sides. Jen, is yours. Jen, I would hand it over to you. Okay. I we have other questions, uh, and I'm really sorry that we're not going to be able to get to them. But we've had such rich answers that neither Juan nor I wanted to halt our speakers. And my last question was going to be, um, what was each of your most memorable impressions of the trip? And I think that Ambassador Lian just, in giving us, he foresaw my question, and he gave us his impression, which I think is probably something that would be shared by all of our panelists. So I uh, want to thank our four panelists for helping us relive this extraordinary moment in history, uh, this event that took place 50 years ago today. One of the questions that I had wanted to ask, uh, but really didn't have time for, was whether our panelists uh, either they or their colleagues who were involved in this momentous occasion um, ever imagined that the seeds that they were sowing would grow into the deep and broad web of economic, educational, professional, artistic, athletic, health, legal kinds of relationships that are so deep and broad of, and, and deeply personal. Uh, I don't, I, if they were real visionaries, they may have foreseen it, but I think um, some of us have been very surprised and very pleased. And I share with Dr. Kissinger and everyone else who has expressed the hope that we can find 
a way to get back to the spirit that was exhibited by these visionaries and find ways to make the relationship more balanced and bring it back to ways in which we can find mutual benefit and mutual cooperation. Uh, we thank Dr. Kissinger and all the people who were so deeply involved in these endeavors. And I just want to end with a personal note. I'd like to ask Ambassador Lian Zhengbao if the next time I go to China, which I hope is soon, but it's looking like it's going to be a little ways off. But when I go, I hope you will take me to the Foreign Ministry's archives because I want to read your notes of all of Henry Kissinger's jokes. So hope that's a deal. Juan, turn it over back to you. Thank you so much, Jen. Uh, and uh, yeah, I think uh, Ambassador Liang is thinking very seriously on how to get this uh, mission done. Uh, thank you very much, Jen, for you, all your help uh, over, not today, but also the course of past half a century uh, in bringing together the Chinese and American people. Once again, I would like to thank Dr. Kissinger and all the guests at the first session. Thank you, Madam Tang and Ambassador Lian. And thank you to Ambassador Lian Zhengbao and Ambassador Lian Freeman and Lord. And also Dr. Kissinger and Carla Hills. We appreciate all you've done for us and for the relationship.